We're so glad that you're here today. We're going to continue in our series um, out of the book of Genesis talking about being made in the image of God. And we've looked at this over the last several weeks. What does this mean? What does it look like to be made in the image of God? We've learned that you have great value because God made you in his image and Jesus Christ died for you. We have tremendous value. We also learn because of being made in the image of God that of how we're to treat each other, that racism and prejudice has no place in the life of a believer. And uh, we've learned that sex and gender matter because we are made in the image of God, both male and female. We've learned that God designed us to serve because he made us in his image. He wanted us to be in relationship with other people. Well, today I'm going to talk about this thought. You were created to reign. Now, what that means to some people might be a little bit different. There are some that believe that what that means is that you're never going to have any problems in life. When you become a believer, you're going to wake up every morning into the sound of angels' wings flapping, and, uh, you know, you're never going to have bad breath, and you're never going to be uh, ill or cross with your wife. You're never going to get stuck in traffic. Well, if you're a believer, surprise, surprise, right? Because that just is not the way the Christian life is. But the truth is, God has designed us to reign both spiritually and physically. And I'm going to talk about what this means for this text. But one of, and this is what I want you to see here, one of the great joys in life comes when you get good at something. When you master something. Now, we live in a culture that is obsessed with self esteem, and um, people want to know how many likes they have, how many followers they have. And often they get, people will get, um, they get all upset because maybe somebody made a comment about them. And I want to say to our Gen Zers, our young people, that self esteem does not come from, biblical self esteem does not come from how many followers you have or whether or not people like your comments. Because let's be honest, much of what we put out on social media is filtered anyway. It's not the real thing. And so what God wants for you is to learn that real self-esteem, real understanding who you are in Jesus Christ comes from your relationship with Christ. Understanding who you are in Christ. Understanding that you have great value, not because you're, uh, you know, you got a lot of followers, but because Jesus died for you. And when you follow him in faith, you're going to live with the Father forever. And forever he's going to pour out his grace and his mercy and his love on you. And it's going to be unending and it's just going to be wonderful. But often we try to find great joy from the wrong things. Now, one of the, and I think scripturally we're going to see here today, one of the things that you get great joy from is when you master something, when you get good at something. My wife started taking piano lessons when she was in elementary school. I think she was around seven years old. And she began to get really good at it. Her mom made her practice a lot, but she really loved it. And uh, by the time she was 15 years old, she was playing for her youth group. By the time she was 15 or 16, she was playing for her church every Sunday. By the time she was 16, she was playing for a professional singing group. By the time she was uh, a senior in high school, she actually started traveling with a college group. And she and I both did this uh, all four years of college. Um, We traveled and we were in over 400 churches together ministering all across this nation. Now, the point is that she got really, really good at something. She mastered it. She became really good at playing the piano. Her degree in college was in piano pedagogy. Doesn't that sound fancy? She's classically trained. She likes classical music. She likes other kind of music as well. But I can remember when I was dating her, uh, you know, I do not like classical music. Now, I know that they say Bach and Beethoven and Franz and Liszt and all these are, are great music, but I can do without it, to be honest with you. If I never heard another Bach song in my life, 
would not bother me, okay? But I did like her, and uh, I think it was our sophomore year in college, I bought us tickets to the symphony orchestra. And that was a big deal. I got all dressed up. I knew she loved classical music, and they were playing all these classics. And I would just look at her, and she loved that music. And I loved pretending to like that music for a little while while I was out with her. But the fact is, she got really good. And here's the point. It has brought her great joy. To this day, she still teaches piano. We have a baby grand piano in our house. Uh, She loves to play. I love to hear her play. But she mastered something. She got good at something. And it has brought her great joy. Now, I want you to understand, we're not all good at the same things. Some people are good at a sport, and some are not. Some are good at a hobby. Some are good at a job, or cooking, or fishing, or grilling. How many grill masters do we have? Guys that like to grill, anybody? Oh, nobody, a couple, okay, all right. Uh, The fact is, y'all thought we're in church, I should not respond, right? That is the opposite of what you should do. When you're in church, you do respond, okay? Uh, We're gonna practice. When I do this, you say amen, ready? Amen. All right, let's do a little better than that, okay? Uh, Some of you are gonna make me come down and say amen to my own sermon, all right? So uh, you gotta help me out a little bit. When I do this, you say amen. There we go. The truth is, we're not all good at the same things, but we all can be good at something. Now, here's the great question that we've got to grapple with. I want you to think about this. Why? Why is it that some people love the game of golf and it brings them joy and pleasure? Why is it that some people love to cook? Why is it that some people are really, really good at their job? Why is it that some people really like a hobby or art or whatever it is and it seems to bring them joy? That's a great question, isn't it? Well, I believe the answer is obviously found in Scripture where we've been studying and reading about that we are made in God's image. And because we're made in the image of God, there are all kinds of implications to that. But the interesting thing is this. We are not just made to rule. We're going to use this word rule, to reign. Uh, We're going to look at the word dominion, having dominion. This is what God said to Adam and Eve. They're to have dominion. It means to rule, to master. So why is it that there are some people that can be really good at something? There's some people that are really good at making money, and yet they're miserable. There's some people that are really good at a sport, but the rest of their life seems to be a mess. There's some people that are really good at a hobby, but it doesn't seem like even though that hobby brings them joy, it does not seem that overall their life has joy. Why is that? You ever wonder that? Well, I really do believe is because God made us in the image of God and he made us to fulfill the purpose of God. And you can be good at fishing, but you can suck at life. You know what I'm saying? You can be good at your job and your spiritual life fall apart. You, you can be good at a hobby or at uh, creating something, but your family is a mess. So if we are going to look at what God designed for us to do and to be and how to live, we got to look at both sides. The spiritual aspect, the following what God says uh, for his purpose for our lives and the, the physical part. Don't deny that God made us as physical beings. I, I talked to some Christians and they, they kind of think that the physical part of our nature, the, the physical part of our body, um, is somehow or another uh, a bad thing. Now, there's a difference between having a bad nature, which is, you know, the sinful nature, and the fact that God made you to be a human being. God made you as a human being for a reason, for his glory, for his purpose. And even though these bodies are failing, we're in church, you can say amen, amen all right? Amen. Even though these bodies are failing, if you're over 16 years old, you know this is true. I'll be, my birthday's next, next week, and I'm going to be 59 years old. 
I know, it's, uh, it's hard. No, that's what you do for old people. He's 83, give him a hand and some pudding, all right? If you bring me pudding, I'm going to punch you in the throat, all right? But the, the thing is, I've learned that my body is not quite as good as it used to be in some things, okay? But thank God for a believer. Listen, you need this. One day, you're going to draw your last breath here on this earth. Yes, that's true. But one day, you're going to have a resurrected body that will live with God forever, and there's not going to be any more pain or sorrow or heartache. And yes, we're going to be able to eat and not gain weight and not have heartburn, all right? Um, just study scripture of what it says. It's going to be wonderful. Um, but you don't, uh, you don't need to deny the physical part, but you also don't need to deny the purpose part that God has for you spiritually. So let's read this text one more time. Genesis 1, 26 to 28. Then God said, let us make man in our image, giving uh, hints about the Trinity, Father, Son, and Spirit. Let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion. That's interesting. He, let us make man and let them. Well, he's talking about humankind, man and woman. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock, and over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps out on the earth. That would include spiders, which I'm not sure why God made those. I know it's got a reason, a purpose, but I could do without them, all right? And I'm just so glad that I do not live in Australia that has gigantic spiders, because if I had to go there and wake up with a big tarantula on my chest, I wouldn't live very long, all right? So, but nevertheless, I digress. I don't know why I did this right in the middle of reading Scripture. All right, so, so God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. And God blessed them. Once again, order of Scripture is always important. Before he commanded them, he blessed them, giving us the idea that because of the grace of God, we work from God's grace, not for God's grace. We work from God's blessing, not for God's blessing. We work from God's approval, not for God's approval. You understand how that works, right? And so he says, God blessed them, and God said to them, be fruitful. If you are going to be fruitful and multiply, guess what you've got to do? You've got to work from the blessing of God. You got to understand the grace of God. Be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Now, I just want to give you three thoughts today about uh, what it means to be able to rule and to reign, to have dominion uh, and how God commanded that for us. Here's the first thing. You got to prevail by producing fruit. Remember the word dominion. To have dominion means to prevail. Okay, it means to prevail. How do we prevail? Well, we prevail by producing fruit. Uh, the Bible tells us that we are kings and priests. We read that scripture together earlier. Let me read Revelation 5.10. And has made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on the earth. We're talking about the future kingdom uh, in uh, uh, in the future during the millennial reign of Christ. And I believe that God says that we are to be kings and priests. Why is that? Because kings deal with the physical and priests deal with the spiritual. You are not complete without both. Now, once again, you may not be a professional athlete, but you can rule physically. And I'm going to tell you what that means. It doesn't mean that you can bench press 400 pounds or uh, run 100 meters faster than everyone or that you can turn cartwheels. That's not what it means. We're talking about what it means to rule physically and spiritually. Then 1 Peter 2, 9, we already read this. But you are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood. So he gives the physical and the spiritual a holy nation, his own special people, that you may proclaim the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. Now understand, he calls us out of spiritual darkness. 
And every person that does not know Christ, every person that does not put their faith in him, they live in spiritual darkness, okay? And God calls us from that into spiritual light. But understand, there's more to that than just getting saved. I do believe that there are people that, even though they are believers, they still live in darkness. Now, are they spiritually dark uh, apart from the gospel? No, I don't mean that. But what I mean is that their vision is clouded of what they're supposed to do and how they're supposed to live, and they just are miserable in life. I had a pastor that I grew up under who used to say this, a lot of Christians have just enough Christianity to make them miserable. And, and, and I think what he meant by that was that there are a lot of people that equate Christianity with keeping rules. And what they believe is that Christianity is a trade down, it's not a trade up. Christianity means that you're not ever going to be able to have any fun. Well, that's the complete opposite of what the Bible teaches, and it's the complete opposite of what is true. The truth is, Christianity is a trade up. It, you have access to more joy and to so many blessings. And so the idea that uh, we are called out of darkness and into his marvelous light. I believe, yes, that's spiritual, but it's also physical. It's about our attitude. It's about understanding that Christianity is so much better. I had, had a guy ask me one time, he said, what if at the end of life, you figured out all this Christianity stuff was not really true? And you died and there was nothing, there was no eternity, there's no afterlife, there was no hereafter, there's no heaven, there's no hell. He said, how would that make you feel? And I looked at him, I said, well, I do believe that there is a hereafter and I do believe that there is eternity and I do believe that there is an, an afterlife. But even if there were not, I would not go back to the old way of living for anything because Christianity is so much better, so much better. So, how do you bear fruit? You're going to prevail. you got to bear fruit. Well, you bear physical fruit. That's the first thing. Um, to be fruitful and multiply obviously means it, it refers to having children. It refers to propagating the human race, but it has a deeper meaning than that. It means that we are to be productive. Productive. Um, if you get a job, you need to be productive in that job. I would encourage those of you that are starting out, you're getting your first job, do your best no matter where or what. You say, well, this is not my dream job. Well, treat it like your dream job and you'll be able one day to get your dream job. Amen. Work hard, work hard, okay? And, and that's, I think, uh, what he wants us to do. He wants us to rule, to reign, to have dominion, uh, to subdue. And what does that mean? I believe it means to be productive. It means to be abundant. It means to be profitable at work. Give a full day's work for a full day's pay. I think it has implications there. Uh, we're to be productive at home. This is physically, okay? Um, not just at your job, but at home, uh, in art, in creativity. Um, and by the way, not everybody enjoys art in the same way, okay? I want you to understand that. Uh, that's okay. Some of you, now I happen to like art. I've been to some of the major museums in the world. Love to what, look at art. You know, Van Gogh's my favorite artist. Love just staring at those paintings and can look at all this stuff. But not everybody is into that, okay? And that's okay. Uh, you might look at particularly some modern art and think that a kindergartner did that and not understand it at all, and that's okay, all right? Um, but what you must understand is God has called us to be creative in some area of our life. Maybe you're creative in your job. Maybe you're creative with cooking. Maybe you're creative with crafts. Maybe you're creative in how you organize your home. My wife, she loves to organize things. And about twice a week, I can never find anything in our house because she reorganizes everything. But she gets great pleasure out of that. And so I believe what this deals with in our lives is the physical side. So don't deny that God created you as a human being. 
He created you in his image. And he wants you to glorify him. He doesn't just want you to come to church on Sunday. That's not enough. If that's all the Christianity you've got, you don't have a lot. Okay? Because God wants this to translate into your work and into your home and into your personal life and into your hobbies. That's why 1 Corinthians 10, 31 says, Whether therefore you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. And if you can't do it to the glory of God, don't do it. Don't do it. I plan on eating some delicious dessert today to the glory of God. All right? I don't know. Maybe I'm stretching that scripture a little bit. But uh, we're to bear fruit. We prevail by bearing fruit, physical fruit, and then spiritual fruit. Now, here's where you got to combine it, okay? Uh, the Bible talks about the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. Love, joy, peace, patience, and so forth. Um, and understand this. You and I can cultivate. We can fertilize. We can work at it. But we can't grow fruit. Only God grows fruit. And so the fruit of the Spirit is the work of God working through you. So don't ever say, well, I, I don't love that group or I don't love those people. I can't really love them. Well, you let the Spirit of God love them through you, then you can. You say, well, I just don't have a lot of joy. The economy's bad. I've got uh, bad health and I feel bad all the time. Let the Holy Spirit supernaturally work through you to have joy. Uh, love, joy, peace. Some people say, I don't have peace. Man, this world is too messed up. You can have the peace of God, okay, that comes only from God. You don't grow fruit. I don't grow fruit. Only God does. And so we are to produce fruit of the Spirit, but then we're to grow in, our, in grace. This is one of the most important things you can discover as a Christian, that the grace of God is freely given. You don't earn it. It's unmerited, it's unearned, it's undeserved. And, and a lot of people say, well, man, I don't deserve, you know, God to do that good for me. You're absolutely right. You don't. Neither do I. But that's why it's called grace. It's for free. He does it because of his love, all right, for us. Now, God's mercy is kind of the opposite. God's mercy keeps us from getting what we do deserve. And God's grace gives us what we don't deserve. Do you see how this works? It's amazing what God does for us. But it, the Bible tells us to grow in grace. I think we grow in our understanding of it and our giving of it. Listen to 2 Peter 3.18. Rather, you must grow in grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. We are to grow in our understanding. We're to grow, spiritually speaking, by producing fruit. Did you know that as we look at these words to uh, have dominion over and to rule, uh, the idea there is that we're to overcome. We're to be overcomers. And I, I refuse. Now, you can do what you like, but I refuse to be a victim. You know why I refuse to be a victim? Because I'm not a victim. I'm a victor in Jesus Christ. Now, let me, let me tell you something. If by that you think I mean that there are not people that mistreat me, well, that's not true. If you think I mean by that that uh, there are things, that everything in life is fair, no, it's not. Okay? But you know what? On the other side, I get heaven. I get a relationship with God. I get forever to have him pour out his grace and his mercy and his love on me. Okay? That's what I get, and so do you. We're victors through Christ. Amen. It's not your strength. And once again, I think this is growing in grace. The more I understand God's grace, the more I can rest. Now, maybe you've got this perfected, but I do not. Um... I struggle sometimes with that because I'll be thinking about this stuff and I'm, I get worried. Now, I know that I'm not supposed to worry, but I do sometimes. I get anxious. You ever just have one of those nights? I had one of those nights last week. In fact, the night before we did the prayer and fasting on Thursday, on that Wednesday night, I just couldn't sleep. Now, the ironic thing is that we're praying and fasting over the, getting this building and, and all this kind of stuff. And here I am 
the man of God and, and teaching you the word of God and trying to live an example for you. And I worried all night long about it. I woke up at least once an hour thinking about it every time. I wonder if we won't get that. What if we don't get that? What if it doesn't? What if it falls through? What if I'm still growing in grace? That's what I'm saying. And you can too. Maybe you don't have it perfect yet, but we are to become great. I want you to listen. One of the things that you have God's promise about in growing in grace, Romans chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. We know that our old sinful selves were crucified with Christ. Now, you know what I should have done every time I woke up, quoted that verse, letting myself know, God already knows, that my old nature, my old self has been crucified with Christ. It's dead, okay? It says, so that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. That's the beauty of it. You are no longer a slave to sin. Now, are there besetting sins? I think there are. I think Hebrews teaches us that. The sin which so easily besets us. Now, there are some things that beset you that may not beset me. I mean, you know, some things that people struggle with, I don't struggle with at all. But there are things I struggle with you probably don't struggle with either. But he says that sin might lose its power in our lives. We are no longer slaves to sin. For when we died with Christ, we were set free from the power of sin. That's God's promise to you and me. You know what that's called? That's called producing spiritual fruit. How do you prevail? How do you reign in life? Well, it's a physical thing and a spiritual thing, but you prevail by producing fruit. Romans 5, 17, the sin of this one man, Adam, caused death to be king over all. But all who will take God's gift of forgiveness and acquittal, listen, are kings of life because of this one man, Jesus Christ. So you can reign in life according to Scripture. God has designed it that way. He wants you to live that way. Here's the second thing. We prevail by overcoming the works of darkness. Now, Colossians 1.13 says, He has delivered us from the domain of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of His beloved Son. You don't have to live in darkness anymore. You don't have to live under that cloud anymore. Boy, it's easy to live under a cloud. Sometimes we live under the cloud of guilt, not understanding that when we have been forgiven, acquitted of our sins, it's under the blood of Jesus Christ. And he says, I will remember your sins no more. It's not an accident. God on purpose says, I'll remove your sin as far as the east is from the west. And yet we sometimes struggle with that, don't we? We like to live in the shadows the shadows of our minds, the shadows of our guilt. Now, don't get me wrong. When you do something wrong, the natural result of something like that is guilt. But when you begin to understand grace, growing in grace, it begins to free you. How do you overcome the works of dark darkness? Ephesians six twelve. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Understand that your battle is not with your boss or your neighbor that blows his grass clippings on your driveway. It's not with the neighborhood association. It's not with your teacher, your kid's teacher at school. Our struggle is with the spiritual darkness of this world. This is what the Bible says. And you see, this all, and I'm not trying to scare you, but I am saying this. Uh, Jesus himself said that Satan is the father of lies. He says he is a murderer from the beginning and that he comes to kill and to steal and destroy. But thank God Jesus came to give life and give it abundantly, right? So we prevail by overcoming the works of darkness. How do you do that? 2 Timothy 1.12. This is the key. 
Paul writes this to a young man that his name was Timothy, and he was a pastor at this church. Paul had won him to Christ, and Timothy became the pastor of a church, the church in Ephesus, which was probably one of the most influential churches in the world at that time, just a young man. And he's teaching this young pastor how to stay with it, how not to give up, how to win. Here's what he said to him. For I know whom I have believed. And I am convinced that he is able to guard until that day what has been entrusted to me. How do you battle against the works of darkness? You just trust in Jesus. That's what you do. I know whom I have believed. And, and, you know, I know that it's sometimes easy to get all tangled up in this worry and all this in life, but the fact is we can trust in him. And then finally, this is where this ties together. We prevail by committing to Jesus' purpose. He gives us a purpose. Um, Matthew 28, 18, and Jesus came and said to them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. He's in charge. He never makes a mistake. He's never late. He never forgets you. He knows exactly what you're going through. In the book of Job, it says that through their adversity, he rescues those who suffer. For he gets their attention through adversity. Now think about that. Why would God let you suffer? Why would God let you go through difficult times? It says through that adversity, He rescues you. That doesn't sound like a very good plan to me. I wish he rescued me through winning the lottery or something like that, you know. Or that I could eat whatever I want and never had to worry about gaining weight. I wish he'd rescue me that way. Or I wish he'd uh, rescue me by letting my favorite team win all the time. But that's not what he does. He says it's through adversity that he, what does that adversity do? It gets you to focus on him gets you to focus on him. So how do we prevail? Uh, well, we, we understand that Jesus has all authority. He's in control. John 10, 10, the thief comes only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they may have life and have it abundantly. John 12, 46, I've come as a light into the world that whoever believes in me should not abide in darkness. He's not going to leave you without a clue. It's always interesting when we seek the will of God, isn't it? This idea that somehow or another God's trying to hide it from us. That's how we feel sometimes, but that's not true at all. He reveals it. He wants you to know. He wants you to know the way to walk. It's that we struggle sometimes with our own selfish desires that confuses us a little bit, you know. It's like, I know you probably want me to do this, Lord, but I sure would like to do that, you know. And then John 18, 37, Jesus said, for this purpose I was born and for this purpose I've come into the world to bear witness to the truth, to the truth. Now, in this, he's talking about the truth of the gospel, true, but I believe he bears witness to truth, period, not just some truth but all truth. He is truth. You want to know how to live? Yeah, and I I make this very practical because a lot of times as preachers, we make it so spiritual sounding that it sounds ethereal and vaporous and out of touch. It's just not out. It's just not reality, you know? Oh, that's so spiritual sounding, but we don't have a clue what it means. But I think uh, God makes it very, very clear that uh, we can know the truth and we can live for him and through him and by him in knowing truth. I believe it applies to every part of our life. When you really begin to let the word of God abide in you, then it transforms everything. You want to know what house to buy? Let God's word abide in you. You want to know what car to buy or not to buy or to keep on driving? Let God's Word abide in you. Um, Now, look, I'm not suggesting that people that don't have the Spirit of God living in them can't make financial decisions that are wise. There are a lot of people that are lost that make wise financial decisions. 
but ultimately they don't make the ultimate right decision and therefore they live a life of foolishness. Because just like Jesus said about the, the man that was wealthy and he said, I have many goods laid up for many years. I'll tear down my barns and build bigger barns. And what did Jesus say about this man? He said, you fool. He said, this night your soul's going to be required of you. And then whose will all this be? I don't care if you are so wise financially that you're a billionaire. Listen closely. When you don't live for God's purpose... When you don't live and rule and reign in life like God intended for us to do. Yes, the physical side of it, that's easy to get and understand, but also the spiritual side. When you don't get that part, you're like that rich man in the story that Jesus told. You're just foolish because you can get all the money in the world. And Jesus said, what will it do for a man if he could gain the whole world and lose his soul? And so this is what the Word of God tells us today. Jesus has the authority. We are to rule and reign in obedience to Him and to serve Him and to worship Him and fulfill His purposes. Amen. Do we receive this today? Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, help us today to receive Your Word and to live by it. Help us to believe what it says that we are, what we're to do. Help us to follow what it says. Now, before I finish my prayer, I wonder today, what is the Holy Spirit saying to you? If you want to pray with our prayer team about healing, maybe you have a physical need or finances or family or relationships or spiritual needs. It doesn't matter what it is. Our prayer team will be over here to my left, to your right, your left as you walk out. And there'll be a team of people that will be ready to pray for you if you'd like to pray with one of them. So whatever it is that you need, I encourage you today, learn how to live this kind of life that God promises for us. Maybe today you would say, today I need salvation. And I would pray for you. Those of you online, listen closely. If you want to pray to receive Jesus today, it's not your works. It's not even joining the church. But it is faith in Christ alone that will save you and change you and give you this life that we've been talking about today. If you're in the room or if you're watching online and you'd like to receive Christ today, maybe you're not sure about it. Why don't you say something like this to God in a prayer? Dear God, I believe Jesus is the Son of God. I believe He died on the cross and rose from the grave. Today, I'm asking you to save me. I'm saying yes to you. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. Look right this way. Online, if you pray to receive Christ today, check that at the bottom of the screen that says that you pray to receive Christ. If you're in the room today and you want to do that, then you take that next step card, put your name on it, and check that spot there that says, I receive Christ today. Um... If you're not sure, but you'd like to have a conversation about it, I'm going to be here and ready to talk to anybody that needs to talk after the service. And so uh, you can come and talk with me about that if you'd like afterwards. But I'm so glad that you're here today. Don't forget about our next steps. Uh, We will have our next step class coming up soon. We won't do it next week, even though that's the last Sunday of the month. Uh, because it is the tail end of fall break. And so we'll do this in a few weeks. Well, if you'd like to be baptized, we've got several people that need to be baptized and are ready to be baptized. We're going to be doing that soon. Um, if you'd like to get involved in a small group or whatever, uh, then you can see me and uh, we'll get you connected, okay? All right, let's everyone stand together. God bless you for being here today. I hope you will live this week in light of what we learn from the Word of God. Turn to three people today before you leave and say, my, you look good today. God bless you. You have a great week.